Well, um, welcome everybody. Uh, good morning or, or good evening if you're tuning in from uh, from North America to the Safe Connection Expert Panel uh, Middle East. This is the first episode in the second series of expert panels that we have done for the Middle East. Um, if you were with us for the first series, um, you're probably familiar with some of the panelists and uh, I'm going to introduce them in just a second. Um, but before that, let me just sort of give you a bit of the background from the first series and then a bit of where we're going with this one. So the, the first series, we were talking about complacency and COVID. It's not over till it's over. And uh, as we all know, here in North America, it is hardly over yet. Um, but that was the first one we did. The next one we did, um, we moved away from COVID and we were talking about leading indicators what would give you enough confidence to suggest a significant change? And we'd all seen lots of significant changes based on disasters, if you will, but we were looking for significant pivots based on, on proactive leading indicators. And that was very interesting. We then moved into zero harm, yes or no. Should you have zero harm in your mission statement or not? And then the last one we did in the first series was on felt leadership. And can you actually get that right down to the shop floor? And with, with Salman and Ahmed, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, they're both working with literally thousands of contractors. So I even extended that to, can, can you even get that, that belief in zero harm extended to your contractors? So those were some very, very interesting sessions. Um, the, the recordings of which are available if any of you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to catch up on some of them, um, especially the one on leading indicators, I thought was, uh, was really interesting because it turned out we all believed in the same thing, but we didn't even know what everybody else believed in before we started talking. Now, this series is, it's something that, I've wanted to talk with leading experts about for for a number of years because the the first one, the one we're doing tonight, recordable injuries versus serious injuries. Why have only recordable injuries come down? And I think one of the reasons we're all in this business is to prevent serious injuries and fatalities. It, it, it's not that we don't care about the odd sprain, strain, cut, bruise, bump, or scrape. But the serious injuries and fatalities are obviously the thing that can keep you up at night. Um, so, you know, effective strategies, we're looking for that today. Um, it's going to be an excellent session. Now, the next one is excellent safety equals excellent business performance. Yes, but is it cause or just correlation? The next one will be injury prevention strategies for young workers and old workers. How do you deal with the two highest risk categories? Obviously, you can't have different rules and procedures for both groups, but hopefully the way you talk to somebody who's been working for you for 15, 20 days would be a little different than 15 or 20 years. And then the last one, balancing just culture and accountability in the real world. How do you make it work? How do you make it fair? So um, I hope you can join us for all of them, everybody. Um, but this one here, uh, recordable injuries versus serious injuries. Um, let me just read, if you will, the marketing description, then I'll introduce the panelists, and um, and, and then we'll get going. Um, and hopefully, Dr. Wada can join us. I know he's, uh, I know he's going to make it. It's just, it's just about when. <laughs> so here's the uh, the description, as they say. It's common knowledge by now, certainly uh, from almost every every corner of the world, every safety professional, um, that serious injuries and fatalities have not come down over the last 20 years the same way total recordable injuries have. There have been many theories put forward, but so far for most companies, it's been a struggle. Is it because the theory or model of serious injury causation is flawed or missing something? Or is it because we just aren't working the system properly? In other words, it's not the theory, it's the execution or lack of execution that's causing this persistent problem. 
Um, surely it's not because we haven't had enough serious injuries and fatalities to learn from. So, you know, do you go back and look at what you're doing, um, if you will, for uh, the usual suspects? Um, confined space, high voltage, working at heights, high pressure, high toxicity, or do you actually start, you know, looking, looking for, looking for a new, looking for a new solution? So that's sort of where we're going to be heading here. The first round of questions I'm going to be asking the panelists is just simply to see about establishing the pattern. Um, Abdullah Marcuzzi, uh, if I get this, hopefully I'm pronouncing it right, Abdullah, after all this time. He's been with us for all these panels, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just recently retired Director of Health, Safety, and Environment for Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. And also just a very interesting person to get to talk to. Um, transformed the, the culture there over 30, 40 years. I don't mean single-handedly. He probably had one or two people helping him here and there. but nevertheless a significant no abdullah seriously and he's uh he's going to be one of my guests on uh larry wilson on larry wilson live uh hopefully in february uh dr wada is is coming up next week to talk uh about integrating human factors into process safety um we also have uh salman abdullah now salman um and I'm going to get your title right, Selman. I've actually got the whole piece of paper here and everything. But he is the executive vice president of um, the Emirates Global Aluminum Company. Um, most of you in the Middle East are probably aware that this is uh, the the biggest uh, aluminum company in the world. I, I didn't know that until I actually uh, started started talking with Selman. Um, and Salman brings some really interesting perspective. Um, I, I can't. Rem I know you're you're just about to get your PhD, Salman, or you're you're, you're very close to it. Um, but certainly, he's brought a, brought some interesting academic perspective in as well too, especially when we're talking about zero harm and natural regression to the mean. And I'm like, yeah, but even. It's no consolation to the, you know, the family saying, yeah, but it's just regression to the mean. So, you know, we 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 talked about all all of that at length as well. Very, very, very interesting. So, um, and then last is is Pierre Jean, and Pierre Jean is the director of health, safety, and environment for the RO desalination company in the Emirates. Um, and I got to talk with Pierre Jean. Uh, he's just joining the panel, um, but just a couple of days ago, and Right off the bat, um, by the way, Abdullah suggested Pierre Jean, um, but uh, he right off the bat he said, "Larry, uh, it's not recordable injuries, serious injuries. The the recording standards aren't totally consistent region to region, country to country. So as you go from uh, the Emirates to Oman or to Qatar or whatever, uh, you may find that um, serious injuries and fatalities." And the recording, the investigating of them, uh, is treated more seriously than the, you know, what what we typically call a, a recordable injury, and, and the importance of of minor recordable injuries is 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 of less significance in some areas. So, just just establishing the pattern from statistics would be tricky in some regions. But Abdullah, let me. So first of all. Pierre Jean, thank you for that, because that I wouldn't. It makes perfect sense, but I actually didn't think of it until you said it, and I was like, okay, well, we got to make sure we're at least comparing apples to apples where we are. But the the concept that I want to get past more more Abdullah is, is is actually to get at the serious injuries, really, because I think that's what people care about the most. But did you over your career um, sort of notice that once people focused more on recordables. Yeah, we got the recordables down. We certainly made a, a lot of rec you know improvement with ergonomics, for instance. So a lot of musculoskeletal injuries did not become ergonomic or recordable injuries because we were we were preventing them. But nobody, you know, you know, I remember hearing the guy saying, you know, unless 
unless you get your back operated on and the surgeon kills you, there's no way back strain is ever going to end up as a fatality or a multiple fatality, right? So I, I think the focus on recordables was good, but I also tend to think that when you just focus on recordables, you know, then a fatality is a recordable, uh, a broken femur is a recordable, you know, somebody permanently disabled is a recordable, but it's not the same as somebody getting two stitches or having a prescription for a muscle relaxer. And so I think some of the focus went away from what I think was the most important. But anyhow, tell me, did, did you notice, did you know, what, what did you see over the 30, 40 years there at Adnan in terms of this pattern, Abdul? Yeah. Well, Larry, thank you very much again for uh, creating this platform for us to to share our experience with our colleagues, with our peers around the globe. And also, I want to thank the people that really uh, logged into the webinar. Thank you for taking time and uh, and being interested in, in what we got to say and how we're going to take our industry forward. Uh, coming back to with regards to in terms of recordability, reportability, and all this thing, and I think every system that you put in place at the very beginning it has a right intention and it focuses you in the area that you need to pay more attention i.e in terms of developing systems policies mm -hmm. procedures training of people competency of individual and i think now with regards to recording the last time injury frequency rate serious injury injury frequency rate and all this thing and i think we are we should we we have passed at the stage now today for me i, I as, as you rightly say you know you're putting all in one basket and calling them serious injury frequency rate uh, that does not do the justice in terms of how your system is functioning and how the system is delivering for me, the way I see it, as I say, in the past, it was good. It focused us. But now we need to basically uh, look into the categories, categorizing them in terms of high risk, high potential that you're looking at, high potential near misses, that it could have killed somebody, but we have been lucky, or, or basically standing a little bit far away, and we, got, we did not kill somebody. OK. So we need when to you, look at the. Did you, Abdullah, did you see like at the beginning, like a, a sharp decrease in the serious injuries and then a plateau for absolutely. like the last 10 years or so? Uh, absolutely, because in, in okay. oil and gas, what we do, we basically benchmark ourselves with the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers. Basically, that's the standard that we follow. We do our benchmarking. And if you look at in our industry, basically upstream petrochemicals, what have you downstream? Yes, you we have seen a sharp drop, drop, and also the organization that I used to work with, I, I we have the record to be proud of in terms of the last time injury frequency rates comparing to international OGP and also Middle East. So, but again, at the same time, we are seeing fatalities at the same time we are seeing people are seriously getting injured so mm -hmm. so uh, so as you said in your beginning do we continue with the things that we have been doing in the past or we need to do that a step change or we okay, need well, to... let me let me move yeah. on let me move on to salman then and see if i could get uh um salman what would you what would you say in terms of just the 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 trend in the pattern that you've seen in at your at your company but but also in also in the region over the last sort of 20 years did you see the recordable injuries coming down but the uh, very little movement with the serious injuries like we we saw sort of in europe and in north america so thank you larry for having us uh first of all i mean i'm extremely privileged to be working in the aluminium industry and not only for my own organization, but I also chair the safety committee for the whole GCC smelters and have a good networking with the uh, European smelters. Uh, and what we have found, as you have mentioned, that the recordables 
have been coming down in all these areas. And the, the, the reason is, is it better equipment? Is it better regulation? Is it more awareness and focus by the organization? Whatever it is, there are a lot of resources everyone is putting onto the recordables. We look at near misses, closure of near misses, and that's why the trends in most mature organizations, the recordables are coming down. Uh, in my studies, I am in particularly looking at the role of leadership and how that combines with the more serious injuries. And the case studies, which is out there and live at the moment, is the case of Boeing 737 MAX. Nobody can argue that these people do not have willing and highly competent people in their organization. They have the best designers, they are, they are the best, best safety officers, and all the resources available. Then how did the two air crashes happen in 2018 and 2019, killing over 300 people? A, a serious defect. And this is where I could not emphasize enough the role of 45001 and the recognition they have put forward of the involvement of the top leadership. Okay, the Boeing okay, well, seven well, let, me, let me come back to that because what I, I just want to get, if I can, just the pattern first quickly, and then what yeah. you guys, what you did about it, or what you you know kind of recommend for folks. Um, hi, Wada, Dr. Wada. I, I, I told everybody you'd probably be a, a minute or two late here. Um, getting on um pierre jean um, i had some, th what, I had some what technical you, problems this morning oh no worries man um pierre jean what have you seen in in the region um certainly in, in europe when we were talking about it this 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 trend is very prevalent and it's I mean, you can't go to a safety conference now in europe or north america without somebody talking about recordables and sifs and you know why have recordables come down and sifs haven't um you know, i think i've seen the graph uh, the same graph as an opening slide at about 10 different presentations. But was it the same thing in the Middle East as well? The same sort of idea that the fatalities and serious injuries were kind of staying stubbornly where they were, but the recordable injuries were coming down? Okay, so yeah, first of all, hi everyone, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be part of this, uh, this panel. Uh, thank you for the opportunity that I've, I've been given. And to answer your question, I will just re, um, remind that um, I've been working for the past 10 years in the Middle East, and uh, I've been fortunate enough to work in Qatar, in Oman, in UAE, and working in various industries, um, civil construction, infrastructure, road, tunnel, uh, wastewater, water treatment, and uh, now the uh, desalination plants. And um, as you said, I will not repeat it. Yes, there is a difference in the regulation across those countries. Uh, there is also difference in the enforcement of this regulation, which uh, makes uh, difficult for me to um, interpret any kind of trend or data that are put at country level. Um, however, what I can comment, uh, it's what I've seen in my companies or my competitors directly working uh, nearby me. And um, like my colleagues have said, uh, there is tendency to, uh, of the reduction of the, of the injuries of the recordables. And um, I've been noticing that in the sector industries I've been working on, there is a, a race to thankfully eliminate the fatalities, but also the LTI. Uh, not necessarily the recordable, but the LTI. L we, have, we must have zero LTI, we must have zero fatality. And some, some companies are succeeding, mm -hmm. and some companies as of today are, are not succeeding. And um, for those who succeed, there is, um, Obviously, there is the one that are uh, reducing their LTI, uh, but increasing their work restricted case or their medical treatment case. So at the end, you have the same uh, recordable rate. Um, right. And they still have people hurt and killed. However, and that's where I, I completely agree with, uh, uh, with my colleagues, uh, in the, I would say the uh, global leader, uh, which I've been fortunate to work with in construction and uh, waste and water treatment, there is a clear commitment and uh, things are being done to reduce the recordables, to reduce the severe injuries, even if we are not uh, worded like that. So you see the fatality reducing, you see the recordable injuries reducing, but you still see 
fatalities you still see serious injuries people are still hurt in the plant or in the in the project okay well that's thank you for that and also like i said thanks for the the perspective on the the reporting standards not necessarily all being all, all being equal like they might be across you know european union or united states canada that kind of thing um dr wada from I mean, he's he's going to be uh, everybody. He's uh, the co-moderator here, so it's sort of like he 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 gets in. I get to ask him one question uh, about recordables and serious injuries, and then he has to turn around and ask all the panelists all the rest of the questions. But um, the, at your experience, just in in the region, um, have you seen the same trend, uh, Wada, in terms of recordables coming down once everybody started? Putting more emphasis on recordables, but a, a sort of plateauing or flatlining with the serious injuries and fatalities. Or did yeah, probably. I mean, the, the, the three interesting, three interesting things I'd like to point out. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just sure. making sure because the technology this morning has not uh, has not been uh, kind to me. Anyway, uh, uh, so um, three things I'd like to say here. One of them is this question of definitions. The question of definitions of uh, you know LTIs, recordables, and so so we, we speak the same uh, language. We think as, as practitioners, we talk in the same language, and we say LTIs. But then when you really just ask you know a company what's an LTI, they say well uh, three days three days of work. Uh, some people say you no know, one day of work. Some people say no um, if the person can't report to the next shift. So what if you had a holiday for the next two days? Well, um, if he comes back on the third day. And uh, you know, and come back to the next shift. So, so the data is um, the data is uh, unreliable. Generally, I mean, I'm I'm talking about generally, the data is unreliable, especially with respect to benchmarking companies against each other. Uh, there's a caveat there because you know, for example, uh, Abdullah mentioned the IOGP. For example, uh, I know that uh, Salman works with the uh, global uh, aluminium uh, sort of uh, associations where they where they actually benchmark. And, and th that data in uh, clustered data is a lot more um, accurate or a lot more reliable. And the reason for that is because everybody's seeing from the same hymn sheet, yeah? They're all going to be using the same definition to define what is an LTI, what is a recordable, what is et cetera. So that's the first point. Second point, I think, uh, is the issue of, um, you know, what they call uh, the Hawthorne effect. Um, uh, about 10 years ago, when, when management started looking at, especially I'm talking about maybe from the oil and gas industry, so maybe Abdullah uh, can agree with me or, or otherwise, um, there was a focus on oh, LTIs and occupational uh, um, you know, uh, safety, KPIs and, 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 and performance. So everybody started focusing on that. Everybody started, and then they started realizing that many people were twisting their foot, walking down the, uh, the staircases, and then they started saying, oh, well, you know, that's bad for our data. Uh, and the, the problem for the oil and gas industry is it really did detract from the process safety management um, issues. And that's why we saw serious incidents in the last 10 years. Um, and there was a loss of focus by the management teams, by the, uh, you know, the governors, the, whatever, the directors, on uh, focusing on process safety management and, and really focusing on the uh, personal uh, safety issues. This uh, uh, created a, a problem. But so the third point is that because you focused, because you focused uh, so much on LTIs and, and trying to eliminate LTIs and linking LTIs to company performance, linking KPIs to scorecards, linking KPIs to people's performance cards, which is linked to their uh, their monetary whatever bonuses and stuff like that. So obviously, I mean, you know what's going to happen, right? Because you know, people are going to uh, try as hard as possible to make sure that uh, it wasn't an, an LTI. Like um, they say, uh, Wada, the most important wood in your bag is the one with the eraser on the end of it, right? If you're a golfer, right? Like yeah. it's, a lot, it's a lot easier to just write down six than it is to actually shoot a six on the hole, right? And so that, I think that's why they went from LTIs to recordables, because there was so much fudging. But then, like I was saying with Abdullah, as soon, well, Abdullah said, as soon as you start focusing on the recordables, and that number becomes omnipotent. Then the really important numbers, like how many people died, you can't fudge that all that well, but there was an off, like very little, there wasn't hardly any focus on it for a while and also not very much improvement, right? I think is, is part of it. 
Um, but I think just you're right about the, the data being the data being part of the problem to begin with, and then I think you're right too, Abdullah. Once you tell people this number is the the target number, then everybody just works on getting that number good instead of the important components that really go into overall safety performance, which is, I think what you were saying, Wada and Solomon, which is, you know, we didn't focus it nearly enough on process safety and we didn't focus nearly enough on what's really causing the serious injuries and the fatalities. We we're just trying to get that recordable number to be like 0.1 or 0.2. I had, um, sorry, Larry. I had a, I had a colleague um, uh, who um, uh, used to uh, I used to be with in the Emirates Safety Group many years ago, and I remember once you know he said something quite funny. He said, "See, in our organization, he goes, you know, we take no hostages. You know, we don't have LPIs. He goes, if someone gets injured, you know, we make sure he died. You know, we make sure he's dead. <laughs> so because it, and he was making fun of this whole thing about you know people were focusing so much on the LPIs." But just one last point, Larry. Um, you know, uh, there is a relationship, as you know very well. I mean, this is your line of expertise in Safe Start, right? There is a relationship between near misses, high potential near misses, uh, uh, minor incidents, major incidents, um, you know, crippling incidents, uh, uh, beyond oh, lost yeah. time incidents, and fatalities. There's there's a relationship. I mean. It's not exact numbers. Some people tell you the ratios like this, but we know that it is a pyramid of some sort, right? It looks like a pyramid, yeah. It doesn't look like a, you know, a rectangle. It looks like a pyramid. So when you're looking at data, if if you're auditing a company and you look at the data and you see that, you know, the data doesn't fit, right? Doesn't fit well. Um, and and just to give you an example, yesterday I was with a with a with a gentleman that I'm helping out with um, with um, one of my research partners he's doing a PhD and he's doing it actually about the UAE and and he's called he did a survey and he, he collected data on LTIs and um, and he was asking us because because his professor does was saying does, to he him, any, does, he, does he have any data what what on like the reflex thing that I'm looking at I've, I've been through 400 fatal and injury investigation reports um so far now looking at you know how many of them would a look or a reflex have likely prevented it right because i don't, I don't think it's, so it's about 47 it's about 47 percent out of 400 410 410 reports like there's there's a good 25 percent where you know a guy fell from like 30 meters and it wouldn't matter whether he got a hand out or not he would have been dead a reflex wouldn't have helped him but mm. there was there was an awful lot where, you know, the guy got hit by a train when he's looking at his phone. I mean, earbuds in, didn't hear the horn. I mean, not not complicated stuff. Just a look or a reflex would have been enough. And of course, you know that if you think about the close calls you've had, all of us have had where we could have died. Why aren't you dead? Well, because we got a chance to jerk the steering wheel at the last second or hit the brake, right? So. We've, we've been the beneficiary of our reflexes quite often, but but as a profession, we're not necessarily helping people get the benefit of their reflexes in terms of personal skills, eyes on task, mind on task as much as we could. But um, but that's that's sort of part of where I wanted to go now, and and what it's like sort of your job to kind of help me with Abdullah and Salman and and Pierre and John is when you guys sort of realized that you weren't making as much improvement with the serious injuries and fatalities as you'd like, which is obviously, you know, zero of them. Um, did you go back and look at, like I was saying earlier, the, the usual suspects and what you were doing for confined space, working at heights, high voltage, high pressure, high temperature, high toxicity, um, or did you start looking you know, did you start looking somewhere like somewhere new or or for a new or for a new explanation? So take it away, Abdullah. What did you what did you what did you do about it? What and then we'll we'll go to Salman and we'll go to Pierre Jean. Okay. Uh Larry, as I, as uh, all of you correctly said, you know, in terms of the number, we were looking good. And and we were we we it was a statistic that we all were proud of it, but 
the management of organization with a with a revised vision, they say this is not acceptable for us to be the best in class in terms of HEC performance. So we should not hurt anybody and we should not see fatalities. What we did, we had to uh, a continuation were, were of the you journey. Still, did you still have some fatalities, Abdullah? And were they were were they in operations or were they in motor vehicles or um, you know, warehouse. I mean, I, I don't imagine you had a lot of them. So, um, were they were, were they mostly in operations, or were they with motor vehicles, or where were they coming from? Uh, actually, uh, both, mainly with our with our contractors, where we they were undertaking mm -hmm. a major projects, okay. and also road safety. Uh, those are another another key issues. Okay. The, the the high risk area and all these unfortunate fatalities when you look at the root cause of it all of all of it it could have been avoided all of it it could have been prevented i mean uh, you look mm -hmm. at it as absolute silly things people with their right initiative they want to do certain things but being in the wrong place and doing the wrong things so anyway uh Going back to going back to what we did, we had to do the step change. So we revisited our vision, the mission, and the objective that what we have in terms of being the, the world class HEC performance. Number two, any organization, any business, being it a small grocery shop, supermarket, running the multi billion dollar uh, companies, or the government. Uh oh. Please. Proper independent of each other. Because mm -hmm. that was that that was the key success factor for us separating the HSE from the project for a project team. Basically keeping them independent. Supervisors having a direct reportees to the higher organization. So they were they were not Okay, although you live months and years together and all this thing, but then the quality of the workmanship, the HSE, the the the, the welfare of the of, of of your workforce, especially I'm talking about the contracting side. So that was not compromised because we created a balance of independency. And also always we we talk about responsibilities and accountability but it was a word that basically flying around for us we looked at it you are accountable for your action and there is a reward and consequence management system in place so okay so unless people went, they feel, you, you, yeah. you kind of went back though like a, this is what i was getting you went back and you you went back you looked at your mission statement and you started basically firming up or shoring up some of those steps and absolutely and that emphasis did it did it work for you did you get good did you get good results with with that approach it, it did it did very much it did very much as i as i say earlier the exposure that in adlock and group of companies what we had is like going to mars two and a half times that is road road exposure that many millions of kilometers that people they drive Right. We're looking okay. at 200,000 people, 75% of it being contractors, 25% uh, of our employees. Those are the challenges that really in need. And we do operate. We are not only national oil company, but we are we are basically have lots of international shareholders, and we have activities outside of UAE as well. So, so the challenges that what we had, it's. Uh, uh, Unless you approach it systematically and consistently, the result that what we were looking for, we have not, we would not, not have achieved. And one okay. more thing I want to really emphasize, competency of the people. We assume that people we hire, they know everything because in our mind, well, this guy has a degree, this guy has, is showing on his uh, credential, he has so many years of experience, he will do a great job. There are certain mandatory training you have to give it to individuals before you deploy them to your work sites. 
there are certain competency requirements as well and well, I think, uh, but, Abdul, I think, the management yeah no no i think that's very valuable you went back you looked at your mission statement you started uh shoring up some of the the things but you also like that's significant right there looking at the competent yeah. looking at the competency but it's not necessarily looking for a new direction and that's sort of what i wanted to try to get at the beginning here before i sort of said okay dr wada your witness you know and now he can cross examine you about it all but um let, let's have uh, uh, it's well, a journey. Let's move, yeah well let's move on um salman what 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 about uh what about in in your organization you know when you when you realize that the serious injuries were well first of all let me ask you did did you have did you have any serious injuries or fatalities over the last 10 years and and did you decide to go back and you know if you will look at what you were doing in the execution or did you decide to go look look in a new in a new direction Larry, if you will allow me, I, I, I like to emphasize on a different portion of where the issues are. I mean, all, as Pierre was also mentioning on the regulation and the implementation of the regulation, most of the near misses, most of the injuries, most of the LTIs, when you pick up and you look at the investigation reports which the organization puts together, put your hand on your heart and tell me guys how many will tell you in those reports what were the organizational factors again then the poor guy is not competent other than we always blame the guy at the shop floor and we miss out other organizational factors at each step of this injury rate as dr wada said there is a strong relationship but if you are doing a near miss and you absolutely do not write the root causes being other organizational factors, maybe a decision a leader made six years ago on how the road interchanges are, you're constantly having near misses and you keep blaming the people who are driving the car. Instead, and this of, is instead of trying to mean, instead of trying to fix the system, yeah, exactly. this, yeah. is, this is something what my whole my doctorate program I'm looking at is what are the root causes we are not talking about. And, and unless we do that, Larry, these relationships are there, but if we keep getting shy about not mentioning the organizational factors, including the leadership decisions, we are not gonna manage the fatalities, we are not gonna arrange the series. And for that reason, you asked me the question, if we had a fatality yes we had a fatality two fatalities in 2018 and i led that investigation and i was given complete freedom to put everything down in the investigation report and we did and, and we, we addressed it all the way from top to toe it was very easy to say that guy didn't know what he was doing the sops are there the the the, the high risk analysis are there and just blame it on the victim. These people are our responsibility. If a non-competent person comes in, that's on me. How do I, as a leader, allow that to happen? Well, Salman, I'll tell you, one of the most depressing things for me, Wada knows this because I've talked to him about it already. One of the most depressing things for me was that at, at best 10 to 12% of the fatalities in Michigan from 2013 to 2019 is about 400 of them. 10 to 12 percent maybe worked at a company that had 50 or more people like these are all like ma and pa proprietorships and landscapers and 71 year old farmhand and 57 year old journeyman carpenter and 72 year old journeyman electrician and i'm like you know that's these are really like the majority of these fatalities industrial fatalities are not happening to companies that even know about leadership or like, you know, SIFs. I mean, there, there would be such a lack of knowledge. My guess is uh, you'd be you'd be hard pressed to even find uh, find one common language that everybody in the crew would be speaking, if you know what I mean. These are small little 
that's correct Larry. Outfits. and it, it was to me it was a bit depressing because i'm like you know we got safe start to four million people in 66 countries and i'm like you you think you're making a dent in this and now you read the actual nitty-gritty of these fatalities and you're like maybe 10 12 percent tops like wow so you know unless unless you sort of get this out to the the world the school system almost it's hard for me yeah, to think we're really my... going to make a, a national like a, a national improvement with with accidental fatalities because it isn't it, they're not getting killed at your companies that's basically what it amounted to you know what i was seeing it's it's not it's not at your company and it's not at, it, it's not at adnock and it's not at enoch and it's and it's not at your desalination plant either pierre jean i mean it's all these little guys you see all over the place that are you know getting leaves away from the power lines and stuff like that but, those, but larry, are, those are the guys yeah yeah but so, larry this ahead. is this is so this is the same this is the same all over the world i mean even in india the disorganized uh, sector the smaller companies in the, in the UK, it's the same thing. It's the the smaller companies with less than uh, 10, 15 people and stuff like that. But Salman, you had something to add? I just That's wanted right. to add that, Larry, at least we should, at least what I call in my paper, mature safety critical organizations. This is where we can have the language, we have the vocabulary, we have the knowledge, and this is where we should make our mark and identify and emphasize on the importance of truly independent and transparent investigation reports because right. that's yeah. you identify the root causes you should not have feebly little safety officers who are scared for their job and they cannot put the facts in there and you know it's it's it's, it's talking to the top leadership and saying yeah we found 10 other reasons but boss one was this one and we need to fix it. We have to have that attitude. We have to have such people. Otherwise, the root causes will not be addressed. And as Dr. Wada said, they are all linked. But you, so Salman, that was, Abdul also said that too, kind of saying, you know, keeping that HSE thing independent, right? So that they could be objective and they could be honest. I think that's, I, I mean, let's, it's not that we haven't had enough serious injuries and fatalities. It's that we haven't been getting to the bottom of it, obviously. Like I, I used to say that all the time. You think the reason you can't get to zero with accident incident investigations is because we haven't had enough of them? No, we've had plenty. We're just not getting it. We're not getting everything we need to get out of them. I want to compliment one thing to what Salman is saying uh, and also to our audience. Uh, your incident investigation uh, procedure it should really identify the level the level of the team investigation team leader and team members that they need to be in, investigating and should be very independent uh, that has to be that has to be key feature of your you are absolutely right and also i want to emphasize as well the competency when we talk about, we don't talk about the, the poor guy, the labor that are the sharp end. You are looking at appointing even CEOs. What are the management of change that you are applying? What kind of competency that those individuals they have from all the way to from CEO to the line supervisors? Do they have the right competency to manage the business? So 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 the competency or affect it goes across the across the board. We are not just looking at the poor guy at the sharp end and just to, to, to blame that, 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 that poor individual. That's I know we point. don't have time, but I have a, uh, I, I looked at one investigation. They were, they, were, they were blaming the poor control room operator because they had the, they had the, they had the emergencies and they had the fire in one of their storage tanks. And when, when we traced the, the, the work order, or the budget proposal, it was sitting on somebody else's desk for for two years. Well, so it, and and the issue was identified, but again, your your the root causes it has to be followed all the way to the to the people who are the decision 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 makers. Excellent. Uh, so, we've so, got to get to Pierre John here. Uh, 
So what asked Larry? Pierre John? Let, what yeah. did you? Let me get to him and then come back to you, Wara. Pierre John, what? No, did... no, no. I, I want okay. to. I want to cross examine. I want to cross examine okay. uh, Pierre, uh, John, uh, John Pierre because uh, or Pierre John. Sorry. Pierre uh, uh, yes. I, I just want, wanted to ask. I mean, you, you, you. We've had. We have really the benefit. Um, I mean, myself, Abdullah, and uh, Salman have mainly worked in in one industry, very wide industry. I mean, I've worked in upstream, downstream, and 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 but, but mainly midstream and downstream. Abdullah's worked uh, mostly in upstream, but in the last five years also through mid and downstream. But you've worked actually with so many different industries. So I want to ask you something. Um, and going back to what Larry started with, with the serious injuries and fatalities, and and given the discussion we're about, we're talking about root causes. I, I want to understand, um, obviously, obviously in, in these industries, there must be some sort of common root cause and a common reason why we're not addressing that root cause, which is uh, um, creating these repeat in accidents. Yeah, These accidents actually happening again and again. So because you've had the benefit of working with all these different industries, can you maybe enlighten us from your, from your opinion, what would be a common root cause between all these industries? And um, if we focus on this, because obviously we can talk about leadership and uh, uh, safety management system, and but you, let's focus on the accident investigation. And I completely agree with Abdullah and Salman. Um, it's it's true that um, in most of the investigation uh, I've seen, first of all, people were not were not having the right tools. They were not competent enough. They were not having the experience. And the result of the investigation were completely biased. Uh, yeah, the uh, the poor guy who got killed is the one to be blamed. Yeah, the guy who cut his hand is the one to be blamed. And it's um, it has been all along uh, like a, a, continu a continuous fight with uh, with companies to change their way, and that some the person who got injured and got killed is not necessarily the problem. The problem might be more organizational. And mm. uh, Exactly, exactly, Pierre Jean. I mean, the, three three weeks ago here, they made a mistake with one of the dams. The the water let go. People were fishing in the stream. A father and his son got swept away. The uh, the father died, and they fired two operators at the the power plant, and said the cause was human error. I, I was just laughing, Salman, because I'm like. Okay, so what? What? Well, we're gonna we're gonna hire a non-human now since human error was the problem. Obviously, we can't hire another human because they're gonna make a mistake. I mean, what what about a root cause? What about a fix in the system so that the next human doesn't make the same mistake? I mean, that's you know, I mean, like that 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 part of the investigation didn't di didn't happen. So sort of water back to you. Like the root, the root cause in these so, different industries. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, so Abdullah uh, uh, Pierre uh, Jean, uh, Jean Pierre spoke about um, uh, this common reason, and he went back to this whole issue of competency. And you've spoken about a lot of competency today. And you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also very passionate about this, this whole, this whole idea. So, what is the problem? I mean, in, in my, my thesis on this is that. We, we do a lot of competency interventions in terms of training, in terms of putting uh, programs together uh, and forcing you know, operators and people at all levels. Uh, I will not get into because that'll, that requires a separate webinar when we talk about the managers and the directors of companies and their competency. But let's say at an operating level from team leader, you know, manager to, um, uh, we do a lot of interventions, but you know, in Adnoc and other companies, like other companies like Shell and whatever, Total, etc., they they developed competency assurance management system. My view is that the assurance bit was not complete. So we do a lot of training, we do uh, we go through the motions, but how do we assure competence? It's an interesting it's an interesting question, especially. When it result like things things like air, for instance, you know, I mean, obviously, we've all fallen going up and down stairs before. But if we were to be given training on it, we could demonstrate our competence in front of an instructor. It's one of the problems with a driving test. You get a driving test when you're paying 100% attention. 
but that's not when people have problems driving. People have problems driving when they aren't paying attention, but there's no way to test for that because as soon as you test for something, the guy's paying attention. So, you know, when it comes to like this, the whole problem with behavior-based safety was like, I could watch you walk down the stairs last month. You were fine. Last week, you were fine. Yesterday, you were fine. I don't know why you fell today. You know why you fell, but I don't, right? The thing I'm trying to get at here is that so often what's happened is companies have only focused on what I call the skinny triangle, the high voltage, high pressure, high temperature. And, you know, I had to open up a session, um, be the last road trip at North, you know, North Hamburg, where uh, a guy, these guys do maintenance on a wind farm in the North Sea. So it's fairly high risk work. Um, but this guy was unloading a fork truck off a flatbed truck. He fell a meter and a half, he hit his head and he died. And he didn't, you know, just because he didn't get a reflex and he didn't get his hand up. So what I've been looking at is, well, what about all of the fatalities where it wasn't high speed, it wasn't high voltage, it wasn't high temperature. It was just basically somebody didn't look and walked out in front of a car. Or you know, there was a lot of a lot of things around. You know, a guy guy fixing a flat tire underneath, and the the tow truck got hit by a semi transport truck, and the guy got killed. And you're like, you know, this these are just, you know, paying attention to your environment. There's a lot of that, but how much are we doing to help people get that look, get that but, reflex? But Larry, but Larry, the question here to Abdullah is really, uh, you know, in terms of you know how how do organizations small and large assure competence how how can you be sure you know just because you train somebody and okay i'm talking about testing and all that but how do you really assure that you know well okay. i don't i don't know uh, if you can well, but i like, think uh, you've got line of like direct parental line of sight and even then you know it's 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 questionable right you know you, you can't keep their balance for them but the the competency is is not going to is not going to be a defense against the complacency that the competency begets as well too right so you know once somebody becomes competent they can do more and more of the task without necessarily having to give it 100 percent of their concentration and in some cases things like driving a car you can do it without paying oh, any larry, attention at all yeah larry, larry but but you know the question to abdullah here really is you know, at an organizational level, because because you know Salman Abdullah, uh, John Pierre have been talking about the organizational factors and not not the not the person, you know, undertaking the right. task. I want to know from Abdullah, you know, how do we assure competence? All right, let me uh, let me Abdullah, let me answer a little bit differently, and I think both of you, Larry and yourself, you have touched the issues. Uh, organization we usually look at the big areas that we think we think is a high risk the things that 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 we know it requires attention however my from my experience all the incidents that i have seen th throughout my lifetime uh, it's the uh, small things that we don't pay attention to a guy a guy is working on the switch gear room. It does not. It does not. Uh, it does not switch off the, the the power supply, and he put his finger in just to take the washer out, and he burns himself and kills himself. Yeah. A guy is is working in the cement mixture that he wants to wash it at the end of the shift and all this thing. It does not require the supervision. He has a hose and all this thing. It falls in and the and the mixture is running. It kills himself. You have you have a guy falls in the sewer pit that he knows he should not be walking on on top of that manholes and all this. So uh, the problem the problem is what I'm saying is the competency is two areas. One, as Larry said, is the complacency. These are the people that they have been doing the things for uh, for 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 years and years and years, and they do it sub, uh, subconsciously without thinking about it, they put themselves at risk and the people that they are working with. Then you have the newcomers that they are very cautious, but at the same time, they don't have the skill that, 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 you, that, that, that you require to, to, to provide them. Those are the ones that 
that oh, lady. I'm doing, you're, you're leading you're leading right in you're leading right not the next one but the one after that prevent effective prevention strategies for older workers and young workers how do you deal with the two high risk groups exactly because uh, yeah. can't, can't well, wait to have yeah, you back for I, that one too um yeah and testing yeah the testing the competency dr Wadda, is, is, is i give you an example we used to hire a driver to drive us in a in a desert desert driving it does not mean it does not mean how many years you had your driving license and how safe of a driver you were it requires a different skill how if you get stuck in the sand during the during the summer how you take your car out if you get stuck in the desert you cannot move your vehicle how are you going to survive so those are the those are the skills that is required because if the driver does not have that competency he could kill himself and the passenger that he has with him so there are certain things that we, we do the, the same the, thing the, here only it's with the, it's with the ice and surviving in the car in the winter <laughs> yeah. so so we gotta wrap, uh, we've got to wrap up we've got to wrap up in a couple of minutes uh, before, while, um, before we go larry, 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 yeah, larry yeah. a very important question very important question for salman here so we've spoken about you know the company we've spoken about the root causes we're talking about all these different uh, industries um and but one one question, you know, uh, going back to what Larry's Larry's first questions in the, in this uh, event were um, uh, talking talking mainly uh, uh, talking mainly about um, talking mainly about you know uh, uh, you know serious injuries and fatalities and 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 the reportables and things like that. So from your research, from your uh, current research, um, just so we can gain from your insights into that research. This psychological or psychosocial risk awareness um, um, and the human factors uh, and the situational leadership. Do you think that organisations who are training their uh, uh, frontline, you know, team leaders and supervisors, superintendents and managers on situational leadership will provide um, uh, better results at the end of the day in terms of reducing the SIFs? So very quickly, because I know we're running out of time, uh, we internally carried out a quantitative analysis of the different uh, interventions we do. So for example, in terms of training, we train people on equipment, we train people on procedures, SOPs, blah, blah, blah. But there's also one training on behavioral training. And what we found from, uh, from our regression models, that the most effective for mature organizations, you, you've been training them to depth to about SOPs and the equipment, but the behavioral training and how not to get into this complacent mode is the most effective one to reduce uh, uh, recordable injuries. And then, of course, we link that. I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty to big on all that, that too, Salman. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's like you, teaching people to recognize rushing frustration fatigue complacency and how the combination of those human factors is it's huge it's just a it's how Wada and i met i was saying you know what what i got great admiration for what you've been able to achieve is you've been able to get some of that at all levels in your organization it, it's it's easy enough to, like the dupont company i mean we trained the whole company in north america 10 hours I got 90 minutes with their leadership group. I got to tell them what it was about. I got to give them an overview session. I didn't get to train them. I didn't actually get to give them the benefit of being able to trigger on the state or even even give them some you know safety habits that they could start working on. Really, it was just sort of a you know a, here's what your company is is doing and this is what it's all about. But their head health and safety person said, you need to train them, Larry, not let them just dip their toe in the water. You need to train them. So I got a, kudos for you for actually being able to get to get that 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 level train. That's one of the reasons I really want to talk to you about it on the the, the TV show there. Um, Wada, we got we've got to wrap up. Any any last comments um, from anybody in terms of, uh, you know, I think the competency issue certainly the looking at the the looking at this system um i think now people are wanting to go focus on sifs so i think the first thing would probably be you know at least go back and look at what you've 
what you did do and make sure that it doesn't it's not all full of holes i think that's worthwhile yeah pierre jean yes, pierre. yeah i have a, one thing to say and for obviously the audience mm -hmm. and all the hsc journal that are listening in um the thing that have been uh, that made me successful in my career so far has been two things and uh, it will sound a bit cavalier or, uh, but i will say it uh, but you're French. You can get away. You can get away okay. with anything. You can get away with anything, Pierre Jean. All right. So be creative. <coughs> and to have fun with it, because that's this creativity. That's the new things you will implement within your uh, organization that will make the people paying attention. That will make the people thinking about HSC in another way, or maybe they will think about HSC without even realizing it. So. You guys did, you did something really inexpensively, right? With the tablets and the little videos yeah. and the stuff like yeah. that you showed to people, right? Yeah. Do we have one minute to talk about it? <clears throat> Wada, can you, can you wrap up anything else that I missed before uh, yeah, I introduce no. the next session? Yeah, no, no, I, I just like, I'd like to say that this is a, this is an interesting discussion. Thanks for everyone's input. Um, I, I think we spoke about, you know, this whole thing about, um, you know, root causes being similar. We spoke about organizational, focusing also on organizational uh, factors as well as personal factors uh, when we're looking at um, uh, SIFs and, and fatalities and, and serious injuries and reportables. Um, I think, um, you know, some common uh, issue is regarding competency within all all kind of industries. And 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 finally, we spoke about in the sort of the social risk and, and the leadership, which probably uh, warrants a, a separate session just to talk about how uh, leadership styles do really impact on on the performance of organizations and and Pierre John made a very good point here to close uh, with regards with regards to um, with regards to being creative because I think he says something very important because at the end of the day um, we shouldn't look at these numbers they're all very negative that even if you have a one LTI whatever you know it's it's just a negative I think we should be looking at um, how performance is improving. We should look at performance improvement. We should look at engagement. We should look at um, people's, uh, you know, uh, happiness um, within the workforce because you know they're working more efficiently, more safer, etc. I think we need to, even as safety practitioners, provide a more positive picture uh, of um, of for safety um, in terms of an organizational value driver. I always say this with. Uh, and the only way to do that, in my my opinion, is is to move towards a high reliability organizational theory. But uh, but anyway, uh, uh, with that, I will pass on back to you, Larry. No, no, I I, I but I, I agree. I agree, Water too. I think you've got to. Uh... <coughs> let me. Uh, uh, let me Larry, let me, this... Larry oh. let me let me allow me to say a couple of words. Sure. Uh, for me, uh, I'm going to echo what Wadah is saying. Uh, our HSC practitioners. Uh, and all the presentations that are made at the board level, made at your different uh, management level and all this thing, please do not focus on your reactive KPIs in terms of lost time injuries, fatalities, what have you. Come up with an innovative way of demonstrating the programs, the objectives that you have in place and how, and how it's, it's, basically, it's basically giving the result. I agree. I agree with Wada and you too. But much present much more of a holistic picture. Certainly, don't just present the negative numbers and expect you're going to get a whole lot of enthusiasm because it's impossible, right? All you're, you're all you're doing is showing people is showing people the bad news, right? <laughs> it's, like the, it's like the joke, the comic. I don't know if you heard the husband. The husband says to the wife, "They're middle aged," and he she she comes into the living room. And he said, you, you want to watch the news? She says, if we're going to watch the news, I have to get my glasses. And then she comes out with two wine glasses. Anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> because the news is depressing. Um, but I think you, I think that's a really good point as well. You know, the competence and also, also look at the whole thing holistically. Don't just present the bad news and don't just focus on the recordables because there's a big difference between a fatality and a broken femur and a couple of stitches and so make sure you know make sure you don't lose the baby with the bathwater. i guess is the expression um the next yeah. the next expert panel will be january the 20th 10 a.m uh gulf standard time um wada and i have already uh been on this expert panel um 
for, for North America. It, it was a great session. It's excellent safety equals excellent business performance. Yes, but is it cause or just correlation? And this was a very, very interesting, uh, very, very interesting discussion. Um, and uh, Wada brought up uh, some, some great comments. So I hope you can all, uh, I hope you can all join us uh, January 20th, 10 a.m. for that session. And uh, Pierre Jean, thank you very much for your, uh, your, your joining us, your cameo appearance here. That was great. And hopefully you can all join us next time. And um, we'll see you all later. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you all very much for attending. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.